God is not isms and osms. And the God I'm talking about don't need your validation. And it bothers me when I see people reach a, a depth of ignorance where they feel they have to stand and argue about the validity of God. Well, well, that don't say nothing to me about the people they arguing with. It say something about me about the person who's arguing about God. Because if a welfare mother said to Rockefeller, you poor and ain't got no money, I expect her to say that. But when Rockefeller starts arguing with her, then I'm going taking my money out to Chase Manhattan Bank because I know he broke. <laughs> <laughs> Let me say thanks to those of you who's responsible for today. Uh, I go all over the world and give speeches. Very seldom do I speak to this many African Americans because what it costs to get me on a plane and come and speak to you, most African Americans can't afford it. So I give back to the community by standing in picket lines and going to jail for liberation. And so I say to you today that, you know, I sit here and a speech to me is just another speech. I, I deal with a moral force and a moral line, and I deal with truth, and truth don't have to be validated by your ignorance, and so I keep moving. But today is very special. I sit next to Sister Lumpkins here, and I volunteered. I asked her, let's get in touch, because I want to be part of this organization. <laughs> Give me good news. I want to be part of this organization because God gave me a vision about 25 years ago and I saw something happening and I moved on it and I saw a system and I moved into health not knowing I grew up like everybody else that good nutrition is when whatever you like to eat it was enough of it and bad nutrition when it ran out before you got it. <laughs> and I went the whole route. I drank a fifth of scotch every day. I smoked four packs of cigarettes every day. I went up to 366 pounds. And one day as the evolution started, and it started from putting the right thing in the body, You better be careful about what you say you are, what you eat, because it means if you put animal in you, you are animal, and then why shouldn't you act like one? Well. The misinformation is amazing. And it bothers me to see so many people who really should be in tune to the order, but they not. That don't know that if this brother get cancer, that's a gift from God. If this sister have sugar diabetes, and this one have high blood pressure, that's a gift from God. But we have been so perverted and so out of the order of God, we think that there's something wrong with cancer. You see, if this sister told me tonight, she said, you know, Brother Greg, uh, at 2 o'clock this morning, this hotel is going to be blown up. I know her morality. She never lied to me. So at 2 o'clock this morning, I'm upstairs watching C-SPAN. <laughs> 3 o'clock this morning, hotel blow up. You all would read in the paper Dick Gregory died in hotel explosion. God, paper would read, Dick Gregory died for ignoring a warning. That's what I died from. Cancer is God's warning. Nobody's ever died from cancer. That sounds stupid. But those of you that know me know I'm far too intelligent and godly and spiritual to make a statement like that if it wasn't true. So those of y'all that don't understand it, just hang with it. Trust me. Take my word for it. Nobody's ever died from sugar diabetes or high blood pressure. 
How did I get cancer? All right. Mm -hmm. How did I get sugar diabetes? High blood pressure? So the minute I get the warning, that's God saying, stop. And if you stop, I will heal you. If you ignore me, you did not die from cancer. That's my warning. You died from ignoring my warning. <laughs> Anytime you hear somebody say, so-and-so died from cancer, so-and-so died from that, you know they are unattached to the universal intelligence. That's the warning. This bell goes off tonight. That's the warning. That means something up, get out of here. We so busy dealing with it, we, uh, and we, and the building burned down, we didn't die, we died from ignoring the warning. And so when I look at these sisters and these folks who put this together, let me tell you, there is nothing on this planet more important than what is happening here tonight and with this organization. Amen. Oh, you can throw that piece of stuff away that you had or don't eat it, but I tell you what, it tastes better than the cancer you got running through your body. It tastes better than the high blood pressure you're running through your body. We have got so used to death that life tastes bad to us. <laughs> but I tell you what, if there's someone in here that come in here that's dying, I'm going to give you a little tip. I don't know what you paid for your ticket, but get in touch with her. Just call her tonight and say, can you tell me how to fix it and do nothing but eat what you ate here for 30 days? And whatever you have will leave. What is this here that this man is still messing me up so bad, got me eating for taste instead of for nutrition? Girl, I, I went by that day, that stuff sure didn't taste good. <laughs> but I tell you what, you notice something tonight when you go home, that, that strange feeling y'all had running through your belly on your Thanksgiving meal. Hello. Y'all know what I'm talking about. I mean, can we really be honest tonight? Yeah. You know what I'm talking about when you can't, you got to belch, and fart at the same time. <laughs> Y'all know what I'm talking about, huh? You know what I'm talking about? You got to belt and fart, and you can't do neither. And I think sometimes God do that just to hear you call God's name. Oh, God. Oh, Jesus. Lord, oh, Jesus. Oh, God. Oh, oh God. Oh, I'll never eat it again. And the minute you go, you go pick another one of them sandwiches. <laughs> And so I say to this sister, thank you. I say to my sister that came up and did, Mary had a little lamb. And those of y'all that have that on video, that video for sale? Y'all gonna sell that or yes, it's fine. Please send one to my, the reason I say that, y'all get that and take it home and listen to it. Listen to what she did. Mm -hmm. Listen to the baby attitude, all the way up to the juga 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 attitude, to the boo 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 attitude, to the boo 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 attitude, because that's then a few minutes she showed you life. From here to here, here to here, life. Because really, life is that short. You're born in a crib three feet long. You're dead in a grave six feet deep. Any way you cut it, you're just going to get a yard out of this one. <laughs> But my God, because of our ignorance, we have put so much misery in that yard. Y'all know God is a good God, and I really don't, I really don't understand. No, 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 no. If you clap, it means you didn't know it. That's like clapping because you find out Rockefeller's a billionaire. You have to be stupid not to know he's a billionaire. The reason you clap, because you really don't know God is a good God. Because any time you pray and ask God for something and don't get it, then something happens. Then there's a violation. Mm -hmm. There's nothing you have in your body, if you understand God, that tonight you can't go home and have it relieved immediately. 
And if you can't do that, then you're out the next. You know what I'm talking about? If you can go to the bank tonight and put a card in and get your money, then how can a heathen bank have more compassion for giving you when you request it than your God? Come on. Then if God is a loving, compassion God, then I must be punching in the wrong number. Y'all don't know how to pray. You don't pray to my God by talking to my God. That's a heathen prayer. Most of them prayers y'all pray is them prayers. God, give me this here. God, God, uh, give me the money to pay my rent. You don't have to ask. God know that building going to burn down, and God fix it so you can't pay your rent so you can get evicted and be away from the fire. <laughs> and what is this here? Y'all talk about God and treat God like God is some well, stranger. Come on now. What is this here? This is not my mother, this is not my father, God's my mother and father. And I know God got more compassion for me and love and kind than my mother and father. And I know if something happened, I don't have to run and say, Dad, they, they chasing me. Uh, uh, and he look at me and say, clean yourself up. My dad ain't going to say that. God won't neither. And I talk to my God the same way I talk to my friend. There's some Ku Klux Klaners down there. I say, hey, hey, Shaw, they look at know, No, you can handle them because them, them white boys with them sheets on, the, 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 the same father, mother, God, that put them here, put me here, so I'm talking to the father and mother of both of us. Well, and I know you can handle their behavior. And I also know that fear and God don't occupy the same space. Health and sickness don't occupy the same space. And so let me just say thank you, my sister, for that. And let me say thanks to you for being here. I mean, there's a whole lot of places that's packing them in now that will never have their body exposed to what you was exposed to and what you're going to be exposed to. America better stop playing games one day. Let me say thanks to all the work that went into making tonight possible. My job is very easy. All I got to do is just produce a body. A lot of and then get through and leave. Whole lots of work went into tonight. So those responsible for that, we say to you, thank you and God bless you. <laughs> Secondly, let me say to those that's responsible for the, the physical part, Look around. Somebody I fix this table, fix this room up, fix the mic, put the lights up, and cook the food, serve this. And when we leave here gone, somebody stays behind and clean this mess up behind us. And to those that do that, we say thank you. And God bless you. And thirdly, to those of you who decided to put your energy together, and come out and share this with it, because had you not made that decision, the rest of it wouldn't have mattered. So to you and you and you and you, we say thank you. The contradiction, abundance, life, that's what life is. And to even be hooked to that, associated with that, a race for good health. And y'all listen, y'all at the right place tonight. Because let me tell you, them white boys, they be sending codes. I don't talk in codes. See, I don't call white folks Europeans. They're white. I call black folk black. Sometimes I really feel good, I might say nigger. <laughs> y'all better listen to what's coming out of D.C. Don't let nuke bother you. Nuke ain't after you. Nuke after white folks. And if you understand the system, they fixing the roll on white folks. The white folks don't even know it. Hear me good now. God keeps sending you messages, and if you're in tune, you'll hear. You hear. Gat that just was pushed through tucked in that 
cut 17% of your pension interest is tucked in that bill, a world trade bill. Those of you that owns war bonds, defense bonds in GATT, they got a cap on that now that no longer do you have that protection. And it ain't no accident that after GAP went through the richest, racist, meanest, nastiest county in the world, Orange County in California, went bankrupt. Now I know brothers and sisters, a lot of y'all don't understand high finance. Y'all really don't understand that. And most white folks don't understand. That was very significant. Very significant. Very significant, because those bonds is your pension funds. And that's not the only one that fiction do bust out. And I've been trying to tell white folks for a long time, the nigga y'all should be worried about is not me. <laughs> and if you don't believe that, find some white folks that done invested in Orange County and see if they could be sitting here tonight. Orange County, nasty Orange County, wouldn't give black minorities cripples the time of the day. So bad and roguish and mean and mean, they said to the, to the, to the Rodney King cop group, bring them down here, try them in this atmosphere, we'll free them. And God says, you do to the least of mine. Y'all big, bad, when you think about wealthy counties, you think of Orange County, but not no more. Y'all worried about Nuke? I thought Nixon taught you about that. <laughs> Nixon got in office and said, well, they send codes. See, if I give white folks the perception I'm messing with niggas, they like me. Come on now. So I'm going to give you the perception I'm messing with Nixon. And I'm going to mess with this poverty money. That was Nixon. Poverty money. That's all he talked about. Poverty money. This is boy now. All he talking about is welfare. Let me tell y'all something. Cobb County, of which is in Nukes District, gets more federal money than any other county in America. And he talks about welfare. Why do they get it? Because, see, white folks have code. They put this group on welfare and painted black, and this other group, white, they put on welfare, but they call it defense plant. <laughs> Lockheed ain't nothing but white folks' welfare. That's why when you look at these urban cities, white folks, although the money is free, will never let them run mortar out to that area because you can't come out there and get my welfare job. Why are we still building up defense and the Russians ain't even there? It's white folk welfare. Roosevelt invented it. And there's going to come a day that anybody you see that say Roosevelt was a good man, you know they're not godly or spirit. That was a heathen, dog, filthy animal. But what he did, he said, we need to use white folks for a minute, but uh, we trained them that welfare is bad, so we got to slip it to them. So he created a thing called WPA. White folks went to work every day and dug a hole that didn't need to be dug. And then their brother came on the evening shift and filled it up. <laughs> then they got their check on the weekend talking about we works for our money. It's welfare. Corporate America, I'm part of that. They didn't mean for it to be, they just put the law for them and I use it. I can take a prostitute tonight all the way around the world with me. And since I'm corporate America, as long as I call that hole, my secretary is a tax write-off. <laughs> and yet, my sister with a baby can't get apple juice. You'll pay for that. And those of you that don't understand that, I say have fun and have fun quick, because recess just about over. Okay? Oh, America's the same place Hitler and them Nazis was right before it fell. Oh, look at the parallels. Hitler came to power the same way these folk came to power. See, unbeknown to most folk, because they get this perverted history. Hitler ran in 32 and lost by 6 million votes. And then while wasn't nobody looking, Hitler burnt the Reichstag down. The Reichstag was Congress. 
and blamed it on the communists. And while everything in the news was about the communists, like everything about OJ, to get everybody's attention now, while everybody stopped, by the time they finished doing the news about they lied that the communists did it, they had rigged the election and Hitler came to power. It just happened here. They had y'all looking at OJ. Y'all know OJ. You know that old white woman wasn't nothing but scumbag. Slut. Dog. Tramp. OJ wasn't nothing but a washed up, has been, ignorant, very brilliant football player. Nothing going for him. Why they play this thing up like somebody caught Queen Elizabeth in bed with her boy? And when it got through getting my attention, I looked around, and the election's over. And if you're really out of God's graces enough to believe that you can have an election across this country and not one Republican incumbent lose, then maybe what you're fixing to get you deserve. And after they got through tricking the election, they had to explain to the Americans what they did. Because they know they didn't vote that way. And when they got through explaining to him, they said, you know, white men are mad. Well, I'm with white men all day long. They ain't no madder today than they ever been. Matter of fact, white men is more groovier now than they ever been in the history of America. So why y'all trying to tell me to happen because white men are mad? And white boy is sitting there taking credit for something because they ain't got nothing else going for them. And those of you in this room know that never before in a 30-year period have a nation had two groups of people, black and white, made as much progress in spite of 99% of both groups lying to one another. Those of us that's decent and work with the spirit have cast something over this country that we still have made more progress in a 30-year period than anybody in the history of this planet. And if you walk through this country, you can feel it. And if you meet anybody that say we worse off now than we was 30, 40 years ago, tell them I say they're a lie and a fool. God's a good guy. But God's a very dangerous God if your stuff ain't right. God says to you, my son, before I, your God, let you peacefully exist with a white racist insane system just so you can pay your house note and feed your family and send your children to school, I will destroy you from the inside. So once you understand that, then it's not hard to understand that black men in America smoke half as many cigarettes as white men, but the cancer death rate from smoking cigarettes is twice as high in the black community. It's not hard to understand why black folks in America, not racial proportion, we outdie white folks every way you can die, and yet we just 12% of the population except one. One way, I do not understand what happened to a white boy on the weekend with a six pack and an automobile and an oak tree. God's a good God. So Dick Nixon got in and didn't get on those corporate welfare cheats. He started rattling with the poor. I'll cut the poverty money off and I'll cut the pot. Hear me good now so you can understand what God is really about. So he cut the poverty money off and it reached all the way down to a little town in South Carolina, right over the road from North Carolina. And a little bit of old uh, puny, uh, non-athletic looking Negro named Frank Wells lost his job when the most powerful man in the world cut off the poverty money. So Frank Wells didn't know what he was going to do. So his aunt, who lived in Washington, D.C., his mama's sister, heard he was depressed. So she called him and said, why don't you come on up here and live with us and, and, and just stay with us till you can get something. So he did. And then he got something. He got a job at Watergate. Come on now. Never had no business being there until this chump, who's the most powerful man in the world, 
didn't understand God, don't understand what happens to you when you violate my law. No woman has an illegitimate baby. It might be illegitimate to you, but God said, if I didn't mean for you to have a baby at 12, I wouldn't have fixed it so you could. Now, y'all play with that any way you want. And sit around talking about these black girls, teenage friends. They've been getting pregnant ever since we got off the slave ship, and you black folk down south know it's part of your culture for old black men to knock up 13 and 14 year olds. Why are y'all letting NBC and these white folk make y'all think this is something new? <laughs> or is it that it's different now that young black boys is knocking up young black girls? Not old black men. What's this game about? And so Frank Wells is working at Watergate. Happy. Dick Nixon and cut the poverty money off and he lost his little gig and now he's there in Washington, D.C. and he's walking down the hallway and he see a light on and tape around the door. And Nixon died a disgraced man because he cut the poverty money off and a little insignificant Negro had an aunt living in Washington, D.C. He said, come here and live with me. And because of that poverty money cut off, he saw something on the door and the mightiest man that ever existed in the history of the country was brought to his knees. Not because of Frank Wells, not because of Watergate, because he chose to mess with God's poor. So let Newt come on. <laughs> let him come on talking about God's mothers. Let him talk about welfare babies. You better understand all babies. There's no such thing as a welfare baby. How did you get here? A penis injected into mama's vagina out of that penis? come 500 million sperms and the one responsible for you and me outran a half a billion sperms and got there first. Do you really know how special you are? Come on. Do you really know as you sit there now with all of whatever you got going for you or going against you, you are the product of a half a billion creatures of God jumped out of another creature of God and hit that deck running and ran up them fallocchio tubes and got there ahead of a half a billion other creatures of God's new life. Oh, are you special? Are you special? And then we sit here and look at all this deceitfulness. Can't pray in public school. Why not? Do y'all understand God? You understand exercise? That as God breaks down, cells die every second in his body. And God gave him a mechanism to get those cells out. When he wakes up in the morning and do the physical fitness and, and walk and move around, he creates electrical energy that forces all of those dead cells out. When you don't do that, they live there and God takes that power away because you didn't use it. I'm 62 years old, went to public high school, public grade school, public college, and there was no law that said we couldn't pray in school, and not once do I ever remember what's praying in school. <laughs> <laughs> Some of you older folk know what I'm talking about. Y'all went to public high school, public grade school, and public college, and they never prayed, and there wasn't no law again. What kind of heathen country do I live in to that after the universe says, since you don't lose it, take it away, y'all want to act a fool now. Had you been praying when it wasn't no law, it never would have been one. So when Madeline Murray carried that case Supreme Court, she didn't do nothing big because wasn't nobody praying in school anyway. <laughs> but we in such a stupid, ignorant society is after I say you can't do it, then you're going to rise up like you fighting a great battle for God. I'm a right to lifer. You can't have no abortion. A right to lifer is not the presence of life, but the absence of death. And I tell them when I look them in the eye, you against abortion, don't call yourself a right to lifer, because life means welfare mothers, 
means hungry people, means everybody on God's planet you would have compassion for. How can you be a right to life uh, and, and ready for the electric chair? You cannot be a right to life and capital punishment at the same time. And capital punishment really bothers me. Really bothers me. In a Christian society, <laughs> it bothers me because, I mean, how can Christians have capital punishment? Are you too ignorant Christians to know that Jesus died because the state had capital punishment? Jesus wasn't mugged to death. Jesus wasn't run down by a drunken chariot rider. Jesus was killed by the state. Which means if Jesus Christ comes back to America today and bugs the wrong people, they will give Jesus the electric chair. Then all y'all be walking around with big chairs around your neck. <laughs> Oh, come on now. Huh? That's why the one time I don't go to church with y'all is on Easter. I cannot be around y'all singing that lie. Were well, you there when they crucified the Lord? That's a cheap song to sing 2,000 years later. You wasn't there then, and most of you wouldn't be there now. Hmm? How long? How long? If you was principal of this high school that we're going to right here, give me a name. What's the name of this school? Okay, Booker G. Washington. Okay. All right, just, just one. We're, now, give me a mascot. What's the mascot? Bulldog. Bulldog. Booker G. Washington Bulldog. Okay. You're the superintendent. All of you, all the teachers, it's a public school. Now, you know you can't pray in public school, federal law, right? So we walk in on Monday morning, and there are the students back in the back kneeling down in a huddle. What are you going to say to them? You can't, pray. you can't pray in this school. And they'll yell back to you, we ain't praying, we shooting crap. I want to be. Now, when you get through laughing, think about this. There is no federal law against shooting craps in a public school. I ain't got no problem with it. Somebody say, say, I ain't saying to me. You want to pray? Go to church school. What about the atheist in public school? What about the Jew in public school? What about the Arab in public school? What prayer are you going to pray? And right now, the Supreme Court did not say you can't say a solemn prayer. So what God are you in tune in that you got to argue with somebody over the right to pray to your God? So at any time you stupid enough to believe that some group of people can take the right for you to pray to your God, you ain't got no God in the first place. Hmm. And so what school we in? Book of D. Washington. Then what is it? The Bulldogs. All right, now, watch this now. We're going to change the name. We don't want to be Bulldogs no more. We're a Christian society. We want to be the Booker D. Washington Green Jesus. All right, now, come on now. What's, what's the church, church and state is what? All right, what's, what's, give me a reading on that now. Church and state is separate. So we can't call, our, our mascot can't be Green Jesus. Now there's a public school. Now there's a public school. Well, how, well okay, then we're going to name it the Red Devil. <laughs> when you get through laughing, Christian, think about in a Christian society, we got public schools across this country named after the devil. What kind of fool is you? What God are you into? Heathens. <laughs> and then your children come home with the helmet and a sweatshirt with a red devil with a pitchfork and horns, and then you Christians go to the game on Friday and pull for the devil. Go, you devil. Go, you devil. Hey, Christian, who you for? The devil. You would be, wouldn't you? Come on now. How long? And when you put your body in order, universe flows. Is that simple? A wine hole 
that your mother or father would not want your ankle to hurt or be swollen, why do you think God let it happen? Then evidently you ain't in tune with that one. The sickness y'all brought in here tonight is the warning. And y'all need to listen to that Baptist song one day at a time. The universal order gives you enough energy to vibe for 24 hours. That's all. One day at a time. I never forget when I first got married. So my wife was upset one day. I said, dear, what's wrong? Said, we, we owe all these bills. I said, but baby, today is Sunday. If we had the money, we can't pay them. <laughs> <laughs> so just do me a favor, baby. If you're going to get stressed out about some money that, that we owe, just do it Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Saturday and Sunday, then I say it. Matter of fact, let me and you go over to the electric company who told you they're going to cut these lights off. Let's go over there and see if anybody's there this Sunday morning. <laughs> I mean, one day I called home my wife, panic. Tell oh, Greg it's awful. I said, what happened? It's eight hundred thousand dollars. Bill came in. I got upset. I hung up the phone. She called me back and said, why'd you hang up on me? I said, I never talked nasty to you, never hit you in my life. But I'm going to get on a plane, I'm going to come and bust you dead upside down. She, she, said, she said, Greg, I never heard you talk like that. Well, woman, I didn't know you did to me what you did to me. She said, what do you mean? I said, you just told me that somebody owed me $800,000. She said, no, I didn't. I told you that we owe and before I could tell you American Express, you'd hung up. Why'd you hang up? I said, well, I heard this trouble in your voice. I can't believe you got nerve enough to be upset because I owe some white folks $800 million. <laughs> she said, but it ain't in the bank. I knew that when I spent it. I can't believe they didn't know it. White folks know everything. How'd I do it? I went in Uncle Tommen. I was scratching where I didn't itch and saying, yes, sir, and not talking like I had any sense at all, and made that white boy think I was gonna get some bad stuff they were selling, and he okayed it, and before the scissors, I went and got me a brand new Rolls Royce. <laughs> Couple of other things. Now the bill and come due. My old lady upset. I said, baby, cool down, because I ain't never gonna pay. <laughs> so you'll have bad credit for the rest of your life. So what? <laughs> so what? The niggas walk around and go, yeah, girl, it's been rough, but my credit's intact. <laughs> you had three bypass. <laughs> Two strokes, but your credit intact. <laughs> <laughs> I swear to you, I ain't got no credit. Pocket full of money. But you're healthy. healthy as y'all can be. Who care about credit? This filthy system gonna validate my integrity over a bill. Well, I just, I just, I just. They repossess my house. Y'all saw it on television. Repossess me. Put me out. I ain't paid a house note in three years. They came and repossessed the house. I stayed there a year after that because they didn't know how to handle me. <laughs> they finally showed up. I asked my wife, I said, what do you think took them so long? She had nerve to have an attitude. I said, woman, we ain't paid our house note in three years. <laughs> it's a new day. Y'all better understand these children. I'm so glad my son, one of my children, sitting here, Christian, stand up. Beautiful. Beautiful. We a little worried about the boy at first. He, he, that boy flunk failed you. <laughs> Thought we was going to have to send him to college and major in, in paint removal. <laughs> 
Boy went on out there and did his thing in a black college. Taught for a year, compassionate, crippled children. Now he's down here in chiropractic school. Taking care of business. I know they're different. I don't mess with them. They slicker, hipper than me, <laughs> smarter than me. I went through grade school, high school, and college, never read a book, never took a note, never used a pencil in my life. <laughs> How old are you, son? Have I ever looked at your report card in my life? Never in my life. I told him school ain't nothing but a trick. The day you was born, all the wisdom and knowledge that God meant for you to have is locked in here. The rest of this is a manipulated game. <laughs> Y'all go to school only as a form of entertainment. But don't let that stuff get back in the back of your head and push God out. Okay. Yeah. That's right. Let your brothers and sisters watch you and the baby ones watching. Each one of y'all got smarter watching the other one because we stayed out the way. And the little baby, the baby boy graduates this year, got so bright they came and told us you got to put him in a different school or he'll damage his brain. The only, only, only grade school in the history of Massachusetts, when Massachusetts had good school, that won the, the high school state science award was on his way to go to the National, but he had a choice between a soccer game or going to the National. I said, I do soccer as you, son. <laughs> he said, why? I said, it's my ghetto bracket. See, when I was in the ghetto, uh, if you were smart and made all A's, we said you was a sissy. And if you was kind of rough and it didn't that map, we said you was a man. Now, I ain't talking about gay, you know, Nuke and them. See, they be messing up. See, Nuke's daughter is a lesbian. That's why he got hang-ups. Sam Nunn's son is a gay. That's why he got hang up with gays in the military. These fathers take it personal. Pat Buchanan, when he trashed gays and lesbians at the Republican convention, his daughter held a press conference the next day in San Francisco and said, my father wouldn't have done that had he known I was a lesbian. So y'all better be careful about how y'all get to trashing folk out here because God might have one in your closet. <laughs> And so I remember when I was a little boy, never hit one of them in their life. Permit my wife to hit one of them. You cannot be godly and hit a child. And all this old crap y'all got running down your head about uh, spare the rod and spoil the child, that is a story about a shepherd boy and about sheep. And the rod is that stick that the shepherd boy carries. And all that parable means is when the sheep get too close to the ledge, you hold it out and direct it. It had nothing to do with hitting a sheep. Now, y'all go play your game. Look, you raise your children like you want to. But I tell you what, God trying to tell y'all something in America, 98% of everybody in old folks' homes, their children put them there. All right, now, y'all go and beat them if you want to, but there's a God conscious in the top of your head that say that's not your mother, and all that old crap about honor your father and mother, I'll honor my father and mother if they're honorable. Now, y'all can trench and frown if you want and talk about that's what Jesus meant. If Jesus or anybody else tell me that if Hitler is my daddy after what he did, I'm supposed to honor him, I'll look God in the face and say, something wrong. And if y'all are my children, I mean my children, and you sit here now and watch me rape 12 three-year-old babies and take an ax and split them in half, if you still got some honor in you for me, then there's something wrong with you and they ain't got a mental hospital that should lock you up fast enough. I've always talked back when somebody reads something to me if it didn't make sense. Honor what? Hit who? When I tell you something else, y'all better start trying to understand and that the best you eat better this thing over much. You better understand what God gave you. This is my wife here. This is my daughter. This is my son. I go to Africa tonight. She's here. I have a affair with an African woman. She don't know nothing about it. She go to China next month. She having an affair over there in China. I don't know nothing about it. Tell you what the French then found out through some research, that when you and I walked in the house, the children know God got a bell that goes off back there to say the family unit is being threatened. What you call a child is a creature of God. Got here because it outran one half billion other life creatures. 
And they're beginning to find out now the more this bell goes off in these children, the more criminal violent tendencies they have. You're going out there and do all your old fun and think you're slicking it, but there's a God computer that controls the entire universe and it picks up your actions by ether. How long? I mean, when I was a little bitty old boy, I, 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 my mama brought me some oatmeal. I, I ain't eating none of that old cold oatmeal. I said, boy, you better shut up and eat that oatmeal. I know 10 million Chinese would love to have that bowl of oatmeal. Well, I was so ignorant, I ate it so the Chinese couldn't get it. <laughs> Hello. Check this out. My daughter, my oldest daughter, Michelle. Mother Chad, I saw her. Uh, as I spoke Columbia last week, she was there. You know, she looked strange, yeah. I keep telling you, Mama, if the girl that had two doctor's degrees, she'd have been in the mental hospital long ago. <laughs> Might be something wrong with us, but I just ain't used to people talking to themselves. You know what I mean? <laughs> Sending me checks saying, Daddy, I just want to pay you back for this money I got last week, and I ain't talked to her in two months. And then my children is going through this thing now where, well, Michelle was the one when she was six years old when I gave her this bowl of spinach because in our house, we had no cooked food, no bread, butter, milk. We didn't violate God. No toast, no nothing. Fruit and vegetables, no cooked food, all raw. That's why they're healthy. That's why I got 10 children out here around this planet that don't even drink soda pop. One soda pop in your body makes your bloodstream 10,000 times more acid than God meant for it to be. Keep giving it to your children. They're going to give you something back one day. And so Michelle told me one day, she said, I don't want this spinach salad, Dad. And I thought about what my mother told me. <laughs> she said, girl, I know 10 million Chinese. Some told me don't do that. <laughs> girl, I know 10 million Chinese would love to have that bowl of spinach. She got up on the table and said, name me two. <laughs> You know, you ain't never lived and have fun with children until you don't hit them and they don't have to be scared to say what's in their mind to you without worrying about getting hit. And some brilliant things come out of their mouth. One day, me and their mama was on our way out up to Boston and one of my little children came on the porch and said, Dad, where are you going? I said, we're going to Boston. I said, let me go with you. I said, where we going? Children can't go. They said, any place a child can't go can't be good for adults. <laughs> And the problem is, I listened to my children, and I said to my wife, let's go back in the house, because the girl just said something very profound, and if we continue to go past what she just said, then we do her disservice. And I'm going to say this again, any place that's safe for adults only, any place that a child can't go, God wouldn't go. And any place God will go, a child will go. And so we went back in the house very upset because I wanted to go. But I would never violate that child because what that child said was God's wisdom. Any place that a child can't go, there's got to be something wrong with it, Dad. Hmm. Michelle, I know 10 million Chinese that would love to have that bowl of spinach. Name me two. <laughs> I ran to the phone, because some of y'all act like there's children talking back. I ran to the phone, called the family, I said, man, let me tell you what, my daughter just laid on me just now. Whew. I don't even know no Chinese. <laughs> Look, I don't even know no Asians. When I was a little boy, some of you older folks right remember this, you youngsters don't. Sometimes we get mad, our parents run away from home. Now y'all help me with this. You get a stick and a bandana. Y'all know about that? Mm -hmm. yeah. And you I take everything, come on, say, help me now, and I tie your stuff on, put it around a stick, throw it over your shoulder and leave. Gone. Because Gregory, one day told me, I don't want to live here no more, I'm leaving. I said, well, get on out. <laughs> that boy called, you haul it. <laughs> back that truck up to the house 
and start putting, because he thought everything in his room was his. <laughs> and I had a little way I'd play with him, like you would do the lawn. I'd say, Christian, that's your lawnmower. Take care of it. So-and-so, that's your dish. So I led him to believe that was there. So everything I said, hey, this is your lawn. He put the lawnmower up on the thing. <laughs> I was trying to teach him about how not to use too much. I said, this is your toilet paper. He went down there and got all 37 rolls. <laughs> I went out and negotiated with that boy. I said, son, let's, co let's come in and talk. Cause, you know, maybe you shouldn't leave. <laughs> Somewhere. American Express told me one day, said, if you even mention our name, we'll get you. <laughs> you ever go to one of them bank machines and put your credit card in and get some money out? I wouldn't put one in and nothing came out but fog and say, nigga, you know that counts overdrawn. <laughs> and if you put that card in here again, you ain't seen the whooping this machine go have. <laughs> you made a difference. Well, you see, the thing about a fire, see, I feel safe when I'm in a building like this with little children. Because little children don't act like y'all. Y'all done paid your money, you come out for the night, got dressed up, so you sit here and say, Honey, I smell something like smoke. <laughs> now let's be honest, what have you ever in your life smelled like smoke that wasn't smoke? <laughs> I smell something like smoke. And if I was handicapped, I ain't no lie. If I was handicapped, I'd sit right up by the door because I know if something serious happened, y'all would run off and leave me. <laughs> I know that. I know that, I know that because y'all take my parking spot at the shopping mall. Now, I ain't gonna lie, I, I'm not gonna lie, I, I have been, I, the, the first time I parked in the handicapped parking wasn't my fault. It was about 30 years ago when they first said handicap, I thought that was for us. <laughs> I jumped out of my car and said, about time. <laughs> Woo. Look here, about about two years ago, I'm out at the, the shop. You ever go to any shopping malls? They got spots for 10, 20,000 cars. You remember one big one? And every slot is taken, but them 12 right at the front door for the <laughs> handicap. And you've been coming out there every day for a month, and ain't never been nobody there. But that's theirs. Well, naturally, I'm not going to mess with the handicap parking. But see, I believe you should drink how many glasses of water every day? Eight. Now, I preach that. Eight glasses of water every day. I drink eight glasses of water every day. So I'm out there looking for a parking space, and that, that, you ever had that pee when it just hits you? I mean, sometimes it say, you got to go. But sometimes it say, I'm coming, I'm rolling on you. <laughs> so I said, see, I talked to him. I said, P, this is my brand new car. <laughs> Don't pee in my ride. You know what I'm saying? And look, your body listen to you? That's why I'm telling you. If you're serious, you can go home and talk to your body with love and sugar diabetes will leave. That's the only reason it's there now, because it's been void. The only reason it's there now, you run around chasing somebody who you say, I love you. That ain't love. That's a game. That's some old manipulated something that we have. Some of us, oh, come on. So I, 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 I said, peace, not in this ride. He said, do something quick. <laughs> Handicap parking, boom, I jumped out. And you know, let me tell you, it's something about when you got to pee, it be messing with you. It wait till you get to your house, trying to put, and it's something about trying to put that key in the door, and trying to pee, it make your leg go up, but you know ain't nobody looking, so you just be going to, whoo, Jesus, whoo. And always when you get to the toilet, to drip and drop. <laughs> Boy, you get there. I know, you know women, you get there, and just as you pull it, you just almost get it. And right as you bring it under, drop it, got you. 
And Bob, what a feeling. Oh, you sit there, and you just go, and, <laughs> and sometimes it feels so good, I look for somebody to pay. I say, Lord, nothing is good can be free. I've got to pay somebody, some, some. <laughs> and boy, you just, uh, well, let me tell you. I jumped in that handicapped parking space. I ran into that place, and I come and look. I didn't stay long. I was still zipping up my pants when I got back to my car. Too late. Twelve triple white boys <laughs> in wheelchairs that surrounded my car with an attitude. One of the things you black folks got to say, when you talk to white folks, y'all got to stop talking in that black vernacular. Yo, hey, yo. No, no. They don't understand that. Yo, hey. No, no. You walk up. Jesus Christ, guys, what's going on? <laughs> you understand? They understand that. That didn't threaten them. Jesus Christ, guys, what's going on? And immediately they say, I'm their friend. They say, some black dude. We parked in our parking space. And we're going to deal with him when he come back. So I said, uh, I can't believe that some black brother would be that discompassionate for some crippled white boy that he parked in your parking space. Let me deal with him first. <laughs> white boy said, what do you mean? You'd be willing to do in your own black brother for us? I said, baby, it happens all the time. <laughs> My boss said, what you gonna do? I said, I'm gonna steal the nigga's car. Come on now. Somewhere. Got on the plane today. Airline be funny. And white folks have sure messed up the airline. And I see white folks, I say, I, you know, I, I can't believe y'all let these airlines do y'all. What do you mean? Well, what y'all need to do is y'all go out to the airport and you know whatever's wrong with the airport, you can't blame on us. I mean, 99.9999 white folks. Now, I tell white folks, if you want to come where I ride, go by Greyhound. And we would never tolerate off Greyhound what you white folks tolerate. I mean, here's a big old jet, the new, I mean, the new powerful jets. They got old white women running 12 blocks to the gate trying to get a plane. Greyhound would never try to do that. We wouldn't talk. They bring that bus up to your toe. <laughs> Airlines will lose your bags. See, it's white folks in the airline. And act like you didn't have none. You ever been out the airline where they lose bags? Them white folks be looking at that rack going around for three hours. Ain't nothing on it. And it look like they'd already known. Five minutes. Ain't no bag. They out there in Denver then spent $2.5 billion for a baggage thing that chews up white folks' bags. I tell my wife, I said, what y'all need to do is go by Greyhound. Ain't no way in the world a ticket counter agent would stand at Greyhound and talk to us as nasty as some of these. And we would reach over that counter <laughs> and snatch them over on the other side and take them to Memphis with us. <laughs> Airline, you lose your bag and then say, well, uh, uh, if, if you haven't heard from us in six weeks, Six weeks, man, I got a, a two-day vacation. <laughs> Everything I got in the bag. What do you mean, six weeks? Greyhound, the airline wait till the plane get up in the air, then start reading federal regulations like if you hear one you don't like, what you gonna do? Get off? <laughs> Greyhound tell you for the bus leave, there's a hell of a storm between here and Tuskegee. Y'all still wanna go?
check this out. The other day, I go to Delta. He said, hello, how are you? I said, I'm very well. I said, uh, you have plenty of bags? He said, three. I said, I said, I'd like this bag checked to Kalamazoo, Michigan. I'd like this bag checked to St. Louis. And I'd like this bag checked to Boston. I said, okay. And I'll give it a ticket. She said, you need two more tickets. I said, why? She said, well, if you got three different bags going three different places, you need three different tickets. I said, you sent them three bags to three different cities last week on one ticket. <laughs> Anytime I get on the plane, first thing I now the other thing about a plane, they tell you, any of y'all ever flew over the ocean, they tell y'all in case there's an emergency. Now that's a cold word for wreck. <laughs> that if we hit the water, your seat will be what? Flotation. Flotation. That's cold word for tombstone. <laughs> <laughs> they mean they will pass you out one of them markers, and you put Dick Gregory, born 1932, <laughs> oop. Now, you got to be kind of stupid. The plane hit the ocean, and you get out in the water in a $22 life raft, and you know when the rescue people come, and they're coming to get that $79 million plane. <laughs> now, 